Hey, welcome back. So we've been talking through our forces unit and we have already talked about the force suit of gravity, but I want to update the force suit of gravity. I want to talk in a little more detail about it because so far we have talked about the force suit of gravity on the earth. And we have said on the earth, we could just use this simple equation right here where G, the gravitational acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared. So you literally just have to take the mass of the object you're looking at and multiply it by 9.81 on the surface of the Earth and calculate the force shoot of gravity. So if there's an old guy listening to mariachi music and he wants to dance and rock out for a while, you could calculate the force shoot of gravity for him by just getting his mass in kilograms and multiplying it by 9.81. All right, and that's all well and good, but the problem is that's only for the surface of the Earth. Right near the surface of the Earth, what if we wanted to deal with objects that were not the surface of the Earth? Like, let's say, the attraction between the Sun and Jupiter. Let's think about how we would approach that problem. Well, we can't use the same equation that we used before, so we're going to have to use a new equation. It turns out that there is a universal law of gravitation, and that is this. The force due to gravity for a universal law of gravitation, this is usually written with a capital G here, is equal to capital G times m1 times m2 divided by r squared, where m1 is the first mass, m2 is the second mass, and r is going to be the distance between the center of both objects. G is a constant over here. I want you to notice that it is a very small number times 10 to the negative 11th. Gravity is actually a very weak force. It only becomes significant when masses are very large, like the mass of the Earth holds us to the Earth. But in this case, we can take this information, which I just randomly looked up, and we can start to apply it to this problem here. And one thing we can do is to draw our diagram. So the radius of the Sun is here, the radius of Jupiter is here, the average distance between the surface of the Sun and Jupiter is here. That would give us our total value of the distance between the center of the Sun and the center of Jupiter here because that's actually what we need. We cannot just take the distance between the surface of both the Sun and Jupiter. And I will write down in our diagram here what the mass of the Sun is, what the mass of Jupiter is, and then we will just plug in our numbers. And boy are there numbers! Be careful when you plug these things in. It's easy to make a mistake with this equation. The one thing I will stress about actually plugging this into a calculator is use parentheses. Even in your calculator, every time you have something in scientific notation, use parentheses around that. It will help you and your calculator to avoid order of operation errors. So if you do the math correctly, you end up with this answer over here. That's the force due to gravity between the Sun and Jupiter, which is a very large number, and we would expect to get a very large number if you're talking about the gravitational force between something like the Sun and Jupiter. Now, I want to stress that these are forces between them. In other words, forces come in pairs. And so this is the force of gravity on the Sun from Jupiter, as well as the force of gravity on Jupiter from the Sun. It is the same value in opposite directions, pointing towards each other, because as far as we know, gravity only attracts. And the reason why we tend to forget this, that forces come in pairs, is because usually we have a free body diagram of just one object, not a second free body diagram nearby of the other objects, but it's true, forces come in pairs. So the attraction on the Sun by Jupiter is the same magnitude as the attraction on Jupiter from the Sun. And we solve for it with this equation up here. All right, there's one more important idea I want to talk about. So here's the deal. Like I've mentioned, we have this easier version of this equation while dealing with the Earth, and we've got this universal equation that apparently applies everywhere. So my question is, how do we reconcile the two? And that's a leading question. So I want you to start thinking for a moment. Let's say we took this G constant and this M1, let's say this is the mass of the Earth, and this r squared was the radius of the Earth squared. And so all of this is dealing with like, hey, the surface of the Earth, and basically the radius of the Earth is here. What would this all reduce to? Any guesses? All right, well, what this would reduce to is 9.81 meters per second squared. In other words, that is where this comes from. It comes from this equation under the special circumstance of if we're dealing with the surface of the Earth, 
In other words, if we take this general equation and plug in the radius of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, and this gravitational acceleration, and we simplify this term right here, we end up with 9.81 meters per second squared. And that's how we can come up with this equation over here. And that's all I needed to go over for this lesson. I'm going to do another lesson on how to handle conceptual gravitation problems. And so I hope this lesson has been helpful. If you have any comments down below, please let me know. And I hope you have a great day.